And uh, it's good to be back. It's been a couple of weeks. Because last week we had the fall festival. It always feels like forever uh, when it's been two weeks after you teach week after week. But glad to be back. And tonight we're going to be continuing our study in the Psalms. We're going to be in Psalm chapter 11. So if you turn in your Bibles to Psalm 11, that's where we'll be tonight. And it's a little bit of a shorter psalm than the, than the last two. Um, these next few ones are, are pretty short, which, which is nice. We're going to be in Psalm 11. And we'll start here in the, <clears throat> in the introduction. To the chief musician, a psalm of David. In the Lord I put my trust. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string, that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain coals. Fire and brimstone and a burning cup shall be the portion of and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. But the Lord uh, for the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. And this is the word of the Lord. Let's go to him in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we may come to you this evening. And we do so only through the mediator, Jesus Christ. We thank you for him and his sacrifice that brought us life. Lord, we thank you for this study in the Psalms and we pray that you would grant us uh, wisdom tonight as we look through this psalm. Grant me wisdom in teaching. I pray that you bless my preparation. I pray that you bless those who are here uh, for their attendance. I pray that they would uh, listen and that they would uh, receive something that they can use in their lives in this psalm. We thank you for it. We pray that you bless it and the, the lesson, and that you bless the prayer meeting to follow. We ask all these things in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. So this is a beautiful psalm. It's certainly a comfort uh, when we look at the world around us, and we see a lot of things that seem to be askew, a lot of things that seem to be uh, all messed up, and, and it seems like the world is all out of kilter. And it's certainly a comfort to see in this psalm the, the clear sovereignty of God attested. And, and some people would say that, that um, we, we make up the sovereignty of God, but, but truly it's in, in every page of, of the scriptures, and especially in the psalm here as we see the Lord is on his holy temple. And I think the uh, fulcrum around which this psalm rotates is, is verse 3. I think verse 3 is the essential question that this psalm is concerned with. And we'll read that again. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And before this verse in the two previous verses, the verse 1 and 2, we see uh, the counsel uh, of somebody towards David. We see somebody telling him to flee as a bird to his mountain. And what most commentators say is that this is uh, his friends, uh, his true friends who are, who are trying to keep him safe and, and advising him towards safety. Uh, but, but we see that they are actually, in reality, edging him towards mistrust in God. That they are edging him towards um, instability uh, to shake his faith in, in the Lord. And perhaps they don't mean so, but that's the effect that, that this is drawing. And, and um, after those two verses, we, we come to this abrupt verse where, where David seems to be in despair and ask, if the foundations are destroyed... What can the righteous do? And essentially what this question is asking is this. When what should have been a bedrock of righteousness or holiness or goodness in society, when once what should be and what once was a bedrock of righteousness becomes wicked and is corrupted, what are the righteous to do? 
what, what are we to do about this? Albert Barnes has a good explanation of this verse. He says, the reference is to a destruction of those things in a community. When truth is no longer respected, when justice is no longer practiced, when fraud and violence have taken the place of honesty and honor, when error prevails, when a character for integrity and virtue affords no longer any security. And certainly it isn't hard to find an analogy for this in our country today. We see a lot of institutions that were once righteous and that should still be righteous. We see them all corrupted and gone astray. We see in in our society, uh, uh, the people around us are are consumed in wickedness. We see uh, the sexual revolution in the 1900s that that brought about all these sort of lifestyles of sin and had uh, other consequences as well. The legalization of abortion that that kills innocent children just just because they're inconvenient. We see uh, the family being destroyed. We see divorce rates skyrocketing. And not, not for good reasons, not, not for biblical reasons like abuse or anything like that, but just because two people decide they don't want to be together anymore. And, and they leave uh, each other at, a, at the expense of their children, at the expense of the upbringing of their children. And we see all this wickedness in our society. And we see and we consider these things and, and we know that just 300 years ago, uh, less than that, our country was founded as a Christian nation. And I know there's a lot of people who would push back against that and deny that fact, but I actually uh, came with some ammunition here tonight. Here's a quote from uh, Robert Middlecoff. He wrote a a great book called The Glorious Cause about the American Revolution and the years leading up to it. And he says this uh, about the years leading up to the revolution. And all the outrage and proposals for getting things changed, there was a sense that the Americans faced evil and corruption which could spread to their own shores if they failed to defend themselves. The sources of this conviction lay deeply within Protestant culture, especially the belief that, the most, conf- that most conflict involved questions of good and evil and right and wrong. And the uh, common uh, belief system, the, the general belief system of the 1700s when the American Revolution happened is called uh, the, the, theolo- the uh, philosophy of the 18th century commonwealth men. And essentially what this philosophy, what this ideology taught was that eventually uh, societal moral depravity would result in political despotism. That the, the corruption of society, that the moral uh, depravity of society and, and the going down into wickedness uh, of the general population would eventually result in the uh, tyranny of the government. And we can see that this is, at least in some case, true in our society today. We see that uh, many countries, I I think especially of uh, right now Canada, have limited uh, free speech and do not allow pastors to deliver the whole counsel of God and forbid them from uh, teaching and preaching against homosexuality. And they say that that, uh, they disallow this because it's unsafe for the people who engage in that sort of lifestyle. And so we see that the moral depravity of our country has uh, brought about this this sort of tyranny in our own times. And all this to say, we go back to David's question, when we see all these uh, institutions and and society, when we see them crumbling to the ground in wickedness, what can the righteous do? What are we to do? And I think that this can be divided into two separate questions. Uh, First of all, how are the righteous to preserve themselves in times of oppressive wickedness? How are the righteous to preserve themselves in time of oppressive wickedness? And second of all, what are the righteous to do to bring righteousness back into society? And I think this uh, passage, this psalm, specifically answers the first question, and how are we to preserve ourselves? How are we to defend ourselves in this uh, times of, of uh, oppressive wickedness? And, and the second one is, is uh, implied in this, and, and, but I think that we're going to focus mostly on the first question. And I will address the second one at the end. But we're going to go through uh, verse by verse and, and see how, how, what the righteous are to do. We, we see the answer to this question, when the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? So verse 1 it says, In the Lord I put my trust. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? And most uh, commentators, or many commentators, believe that this psalm 
was written in one of three time periods in David's life. And we don't really get anything from the psalm to tell us uh, if this is right or wrong or which, which interpretation is correct, but there's three major time frames in David's life where people think he wrote this psalm. Uh, the first would be when David was still serving as a courtier in, in Saul's court and he was trying to kill him. The second would be uh, when Saul killed all the priests at Nob in uh, 1 Samuel 22, when he slew all the priests uh, in, in a fit of rage. And lastly, it could be when Absalom uh, built up his rebellion in 2 Samuel 15. So those are the three uh, time frames that it could have possibly been written in. The problem with all three of these is that in verse 1, it seems to suggest that David is refuting this idea, is, is uh, shying away from this idea of fleeing, of running away. And so some commentators say, well, well, none of those time periods fit, because in each one of those times, David did run away in the end. So was he uh, at first uh, shunning this sin of fleeing? Was he at first being righteous, and eventually he caved to this distrust of God? Well, I don't think so. And I'd like to, to show you why not. If, if you turn to 1 Samuel 20, 1 Samuel 20, and I'm gonna, we're going to look at these three passages and the surrounding text, and we're going to see why I don't think that um, it is wrong to understand this of David, that he was sinning and fleeing in any of these situations, and that, that they could be possible times when he wrote this. So 1 Samuel 20. And again, this is when uh, David was still living in Saul's court when he was one of his generals. And this is right before he... He finally fled because Saul was trying to kill him. 1 Samuel 20 and verse 11. <clears throat> and Jonathan said to David, let us go, uh, come, let us go out into the field. So both of them went out into the field. Then Jonathan said to David, the Lord God of Israel is witness. When I have sounded out my father sometime tomorrow or the third day, and indeed there is good towards David. And I do not send to you and tell you, may the Lord do so much, uh, do so and much more to Jonathan. But if it pleases my father to do you evil, then I will report it to you and send you away that you may go in safety. And the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. And you shall not only show me the kindness of the Lord while I still live, that I may not die, but you shall not cut off your kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord has cut off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, let the Lord Require it at the hand of David's enemies. Now, the reason I read this is if you uh, uh, look at that passage, there are uh, six mention, mentions, mentionings of the name Jehovah. And it is Jonathan speaking, but we can see that David and Jonathan had this relationship where, where Jehovah was very important to them. And so David did not have his mind off the Lord when he ran away from Saul. I think in the, in the next chapter, or even, yeah, in the, in the next chapter, David, David runs away. But, but we see that he is still focusing on the Lord during this situation. So he's not sinfully mistrusting the Lord, but, but he is putting his confidence in him even while he's running away. If you turn just a few chapters over to uh, 1 Samuel 23, this is right after, uh, this is the chapter after Saul slays all the priests, uh, which is another time that the Commentators say this could have happened. 1 Samuel 23 and verse 9. When David knew that Saul plotted evil against him, he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring the ephod here. And then David said, O Lord God of Israel, your servant has certainly heard that Saul seeks to come to Cala to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Cala deliver me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Then David said, will the men of Cala deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver you. So once again, in this situation, David is running away once more. But what does he do first? He consults the Lord. He asks him what he should do. And if you turn back to Psalms and look at Psalm 3, which we, we examined a few weeks ago. And again, I'm going through all these passages uh, because these are potential times when David could have written this. Psalm 3 and verse 1, 
Uh, this is when David uh, fled from Absalom, which was another time the commentator said this could have happened. Uh, Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. And the reason that I'm, I'm reading all these and I'm showing you is because is it would be kind of confusing if we understood in verse 1 this to be talking about uh, literally running away. If David was condemning literally running away from his enemies and fleeing uh, from Saul or fleeing from Absalom and saying that that is sinful. And I don't, under, I don't think that that's what David is saying. I don't think that making a decision uh, to run away from your enemies is necessarily sinful. But if you look at the, the actual language of the verse, it says, how can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? So I don't think what David is condemning here is, is actually physically running away. It's a running away in your soul from trusting in the Lord. It is having your confidence, your soul shaken so much that you abandon hope in the Lord. And that's how we can see David so often in his life running away from Saul or running away from Absalom. And yet he, he does not sin in these situations. He's blessed in these situations. Because it's not talking about a physical fleeing, but it's talking about a, a spiritual, in your mind, uh, having your confidence in God rattled. And so that, that's the point in saying this. So, so that, that's the... Um, the context here. He's not, not talking about running away, but, but mistrusting the Lord. And we look in verse 2. You see the reason why his, his friends are telling him to run away. For look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string, that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. And so we see uh, that David is in danger here. He is in danger for his life. And his friends are, are concerned for him. But in their concern for him, they are shaking his trust in God. And we can almost see in this verse that, that David seems to be shaken. We, we see this emphatic language, uh, the, the, the danger, the wicked bend their bow, they make their arrow on the string, they want to shoot secretly at the upright in heart. We see that David is almost uh, despairing himself here, even though he's condemning this sort of thinking and the, and the thinking of uh, misplacing or, or not placing your trust in God. But we see that he's almost drawn into this. And in verse 3, we see this even more. He says, all, almost out of the blue, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And that sounds like a, a very desperate call. It sounds like a, an absolute uh, uh, worrying over, over what's going on. We, we see the foundations of righteousness in, in the nation are destroyed. What can I do? What am I supposed to do? It almost uh, is reminiscent of Elijah, where he, he runs to the mountains because the uh, Queen Jezebel uh, seeks his life. And he's like, what, what am I going to do about this? And that's, that's almost David's attitude here. And again, this seems to be the verse, the question that David is trying to answer in this. And it doesn't take him long to find the answer. If we read in verse 4, he answers the question immediately. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is, is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. And in my studies, I've, I've liked to call this chapter... Uh, the psalm of abruptness, because uh, we keep seeing these phrases that, that just come out of David's mouth that are completely unprovoked, and, and they're just th these on-the-nose statements. In verse 1, he just says, in the Lord I put my trust. That's the first verse, the, the first words in this psalm are just, in the Lord I put my trust. Again, verse 3, he almost out of the blue says, if the, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? He just throws that out there all of a sudden. And, and right after that desperate statement, he makes the statement, he answers his own question, the Lord is in his holy temple. And so we see all these very on-the-nose statements. I just think it's very interesting. But, but we see the answer to what can the righteous do. We see that, that God is in heaven, that his throne is in heaven, that he sees everything that happens. And sometimes it's hard because we think of heaven as being far away, and if that's where God is, then he must be far from us. But, but I love this uh, quote by Dale Ralph Davis. He says, uh, like I said, and we may be tempted to say, how can that help? Uh, that's just what I was afraid of. He's light years away. But note the imagery, especially about the throne's eyes and eyelids. David rep 
implies that his picture does not imply that Jehovah is removed, but that he rules on his throne. That throne is not the place of inactivity, but of supremacy. It does not suggest distance, but dominion. Jehovah's exaltedness or transcendence doesn't indicate distance or indifference, but activity which leads to judgment. So God's sovereign in heaven. That's what David is saying here. He is judging actively, and he is seeing actively the, the, uh, the deeds of men and, and their wicked actions. And he, he is looking upon the righteous to defend them. And this verse reminds me a lot of, of Psalm 10 and verse 14, which we went over two weeks ago. In that verse it says, But you have seen, for you observe trouble and grief, to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. So God doesn't just sit on his throne and passively observe what's going on. But he is uh, looking on to help the righteous and to punish the wicked. And that's David's point here in Psalm 11. That he's not just up there sitting on his throne, looking and being an observer, like, like watching a play, but, but that he is looking on to help his people and to punish his enemies. And we're often very troubled about the offenses that the wicked put to us. But in putting this uh, statement right after the question, what can the righteous do? David is, is saying that the righteous must put their trust in God. That they must actively trust in him and, and not worry and not fear for tomorrow, but trust that God is able to deliver us, that he is able to protect us. And it says that he tests the children of men. We see in verse 5 what this testing consists of. It says, the Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. We see here that when God tries and tests the righteous, when he puts fire under the righteous, it's not to punish them, but it's to uh, make them more pure. As gold is, to, uh, as gold, uh, is put in a fire to refine it, that, that is why God tests us, so that we may become better, so that we may become stronger for him. But when he puts fire under the wicked, when he tries and tests the wicked, it's not to make them better, but it's to punish them for their wickedness. It's almost a pretaste of what they will experience in hell. And that's what David's saying here. He tests the righteous with his, with his fire, but he hates the wicked. And any time he, he tests them, um, it, it is out of punishment. And, and we see this even more in verse 6. Upon the wicked he will rain coals. Fire and brimstone and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. And in the New King James, this word, uh, it says, upon the wicked he will rain coals. And this Hebrew word is translated coals. But in the Old King James, it's translated as snares. That's because the Hebrew word for coals and the Hebrew word for snares are very similar. So I think the, the uh, Old King James translators came to a different conclusion. But I think that uh, as scary as, as hot coals are being rained down, I think that snares is almost more frightening. Because it implies that whatever action God takes toward the wicked, it is only to entrap them, to, to make them fall further into their wickedness. And this is not... Uh, any, any fault of God's, this is not to uh, impute uh, wickedness to God. Uh, I know that John Calvin often used the uh, metaphor that when the sun uh, beats upon manure and it stinks more, that doesn't, that's not the fault of the sun, that's the fault of the manure for its wickedness. And we see whatever uh, action God takes toward the wicked only brings them down into further wickedness. If he gives them blessing... They, uh, I, like, I have you guys like that analogy, I just did it in last time. But if he gives them blessings, it is only to entrap them, to, to, to build themselves up in their own ego. They don't thank God for the blessings, or if they do, they don't truly do it in their heart. They, they praise themselves for the blessings. But if he takes them away, they curse God. And they say, he, he's done this to me. Anything that God, any action that God takes toward the wicked is, is, is a snare to them. Not because it's something evil done by God, but because the wicked are so wicked that, that everything to them is, is a chance and opportunity for more wickedness. And uh, in this verse, we begin to see the eternal uh, por uh, portion of the wicked, that they will uh, forever uh, have fire and brimstone. It says that's the portion of their cup. That's their just desserts. That will be the end of them, is, is fire and brimstone and, and coal. But in verse 7, uh, we see the contrast of that. We see the end of the righteous. It says, for the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. 
his countenance beholds the upright. And that phrase, uh, his countenance beholds the upright, goes very well with uh, verse 4, where it says, his eyes behold uh, and test the sons of men. But it's actually better translated in this way. The righteous ones will behold his face. And this reminds me of uh, what Christ said in Matthew 5, 8. The pure, blessed are the pure in heart, for the, they shall see God. And this is our portion. If we truly love God, if we truly serve him, if we are truly trying to be upright in our lives, this will be uh, the portion of our cup, that we will see the face of God. And what a, a reward that is. So how does all this answer the two questions that I opposed, that I posed in the beginning? The first one of these was, how are the righteous to preserve themselves in times of oppressive wickedness? Well, it's important to remember what I said earlier uh, when answering this question. It's not about, uh, when David says, um, how can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? He is not condemning a specific uh, life decision that he's making. He's not condemning uh, running away from his enemies. And I think if we took that in this way, it would make us become obsessive over, well, am I doing this? Is this trusting God? Is this trusting God? What decision should I make here? But that's not the point. I think the point of of this passage is that whatever we do, whatever choice we need to make, we need to be in in full trust of God. And not only uh, did we see um, David uh, uh, running from his enemies, but, but we see many other Old Testament characters doing the same. Um, we see, uh, I wrote some examples down, but I don't know where they went. But, but we see many uh, examples of, of Old Testament uh, people running away from their troubles and, and not being punished for their sin. Because uh, it's not sin. It's, it's not, they did not do it in mistrust of God. Well, again, what this, this psalm is emphasizing is do not distrust God. It's not saying don't make this decision or don't make that decision. It's saying whatever you do, make sure that you trust in God. And when we do this, we can be sure that God will preserve us. It's not about how do we preserve ourselves. It's not about what can the righteous do. It's about what God can do in our preservation. We need to live intelligently. Sometimes for our own safety, uh, we need to um, make certain decisions that that seem on the face like we're mistrusting God. I just remembered one of the examples I wrote down. Paul, in in the uh, Acts, he ran away from the Jews in, in a basket. It seems like he was being a coward, but, but he was not. He was trusting that God would preserve him, but he had to make a specific decision. And I think a lot of times um, the, pro- the popularity of the uh, prosperity gospel today can kind of make us wary about the things that we do. Uh, for, uh, specific examples should be, uh, should I get health insurance because isn't God going to heal me? Is, uh, isn't God supposed to take care of my physical body? Well, well we should prepare our lives uh, in, a, in a responsible way. But that does not mean that we, we abandon trust in God. But the, the point that I'm trying to emphasize here is, is that this, this psalm is not, don't make this decision, don't make that decision. It's in whatever you do, whatever you have to do to, to live right, do that, but always trust in God. And that's the point. And that's the answer to the question, uh, what can the righteous do to preserve themselves in times of oppressive wickedness? But the second question is perhaps, a little bit a more, a more difficult one. What can the righteous do to bring righteousness back into society? And certainly this was on David's mind, seeing the evil of King Saul and seeing the oppressive nature of him and, and wondering, what are we supposed to do about this? We're supposed to be God's people. We're supposed to be acting in righteousness. And yet our, our king is, is slaying the priests of God. He is evil. What are we going to do about this? And this is a, certainly a very hard question because I don't know that I can answer it in specific cases. Going back to what I said earlier about uh, our government being founded on Christian principles. Sometimes uh, we see the uh, oppressiveness of our government so clearly that we wonder, should we be doing the same thing? Should we be starting a a revolution like the Founding Fathers? And my uh, point here tonight is not to answer those questions. I think that that it is good to work about social change, the... the, uh, good things that that, uh, organizations like uh, Carolina uh, Crisis Pregnancy Center are doing. That's that's great stuff. That's really good to to bring about social change. But I can't answer specific questions about what we should be doing to bring 
uh, righteousness back into society. But I can answer this question. And and if you uh, turn to Deuteronomy 10, I can answer the question of how we should be living to bring righteousness back into society. The basis, the basic, the, the, the basic thing that we can be doing to bring righteousness back into society is answered in this question, in this passage. In Deuteronomy 10, in verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. So we see, again, I, I can't answer specific questions of what should we be doing to make our country better. I can't answer that. But what I can tell you and adjure you to do is to live in the light of God's law, to follow God's statutes and his precepts. Because this is the best way to do it. This is the, uh, the basic way that we should be converting our society, is by witnessing, uh, by sharing the gospel, and, and by our testimony. And that's what the righteous can be doing. It is, is living in light of God's law. Not following the wicked. Not following them into their sins. But be a shining light by, by following the law of God. That's what the righteous can be doing. And ultimately, I hope that you see that all of this points to trusting in God. That the ultimate thing we must do is put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his Father and the Holy Spirit. And that we know that we will be blessed when we do these things. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to teach once again, and I pray that something I said is helpful to somebody in here. As I often say, Lord, if one person walks away from, from this lesson with, with uh, a new perspective or, or, or a better uh, idea of things or, or some help in their lives, if just one person walks away like that, it will, be, it will have been enough. And I pray that this will have been helpful to, to these people. Lord, I pray that you hear our petitions, that you would answer the prayers that we are about to offer to you. I ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Does anybody need a prayer sheet?